clear right now? Yes. Okay, thank you. Okay, so hello everyone. Uh, welcome to this webinar on the Westwise platform. I'm Rajesh Dubey. I work at IIT Kharagpur and my major area of work is on sustainability, circular economy, resource recovery for waste management. And this is the fourth uh, webinar that I'm moderating on this platform. And you can watch the previous recordings on uh, Westwise uh, uh, website, uh, the link is there. So earlier we also tried to do webinars in the bilingual, which was Hindi and English, but today's webinar is just focused on English. And we are really privileged to have four world-class experts with us on critical minerals uh, uh, domain. Uh, and we are looking forward to learning from them. So just a few announcements that if you have any questions, uh, please use the question and answer feature. Uh, and I'll, I'll, I'll keep, keep an eye on that and we'll get that answer from our panelists. Uh, for your introduction, we do strongly encourage each one of you to introduce yourself. So please use the chat function for that, where you can introduce where you are from, why you are interested in this webinar, and whatever comments you have, if you have certain, uh, you, you can share your thoughts there as well. But Q&A should be under question and answer uh, uh, box. And so for other things, use chat function. And um, this webinar will be recorded and it will be available on Wishwise website. And uh, if you want to stay updated about the, all the different webinars that happen on this website, you can subscribe to the newsletter and we also follow on social media. So we'll get uh, going. Uh, so we have uh, the topic of the today's webinar is on recovery of critical minerals from waste, predominantly focused in India, but also we'll have some global contest there. We have four uh, panelists, uh, Dr. Rajesh Chatta, a senior fellow, Center for Social and Economic Progress. And he has worked extensively on regional and multilateral issues pertaining to international trade. His uh, other areas of interest include foreign direct investment, agricultural market, and he has worked with various government agencies in India and around the world. Uh, we have Dr. Sapna Narula. She comes from uh, Nalanda University. She is professor and dean in the School of Management. And she has been working there for several decades. Uh, she works in the area of environmental, social, and corporate governance and sustainable business domain. And uh, so she will be bringing her expertise on the panel today. We have Mohan Yaliseki, Dr. Mohan Yaliseki, who is Associate Professor in uh, Resource Engineering in Monash. Mohan, we can uh, describe him as like a complete mining engineer. He, he, he looks at the complete life cycle of mining from uh, very big, including the environmental impact and has been working in this domain for all more than two and two and a half decades in Australia, USA, India, and worked with several organizations, uh, CSIRO, Yale University, IIT Bombay, and others. Uh, There's a long list actually. Uh, then we have Tim, uh, Tim Warner from uh, Geography, Earth and Atmosphere School at uh, Melbourne University, University of Melbourne. Uh, he is, uh, he works with uh, geography, uh, like a, his research is focused on economic geology, industrial ecology, GIS, remote sensing, and he has been looking at critical windows very uh, in detail from uh, Australian perspective. So we'll get started uh, with this. I'll, I'll invite Mohan to talk about the global context on this topic to start with. So Mohan, floor is yours. And we'll try to give five minutes each for each panelist in this first round. Yeah, good afternoon, good morning, and whichever uh, you know a, uh, part of the world that you are. So namaste from down under. My name is Mohan Yelishati, and I work at uh, Monash University. Just on a lighter side, I keep saying this, uh, like uh, Monash and Mohan, they resonate with each other because you know when you change the order of the letters that make up Monash, it becomes Mohan's University. That's a normal way that I start off. So thank you, uh, organizers. I really appreciate uh, a very important topic that you brought up to the fore and uh, a lot of debate is happening worldwide and we must also act, not only talk, but also act as far as India is concerned. So without further to do, I'm also uh, uh, a co-founder of uh, Critical Minerals Consortium at uh, Monash University, which is about three years baby now and also Resources Trinity, which combines three distinct two areas, uh, namely critical minerals, mine tailings, and mine rehabilitation. Those are my areas of expertise. Uh, so just a quick uh, 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 understanding about critical minerals, because I see 
participants with a variety of different backgrounds. So critical minerals or critical raw materials are those with particular importance to economy because they're very important. They end up in most modern technologies. The screens that you're looking at today, they are made out of the indium. So I call one of my colleagues who is also part of this uh, webinar, Dr. Tim Werner as an indium man. So he has done uh, groundbreaking research uh, on indium. And at the same time, with a very high risk of supply disruptions. So that means those are critical minerals. And the picture that, uh, that you see at the bottom of that does signify the importance of these metals. For example, if you looked at uh, a typical circuit board on, on televisions in 1980s, it consisted about 11 elements. By 1990, you added four to that. And in 2000s, it's a pack of 45 metals. So that's the important, growing importance of these metals. And some of the metals we haven't heard because at least my generation, when I was at uh, university or school, uh, we never bothered. Uh, we just discarded them into the tailings or the mine waste. So what is the problem? The problem, they are critical because one, they are not directly mined for majority of these metals, but also there's a huge supply concentration. Some countries control almost up to 80% of their supplies. That's where world has woken up and said, oh, we need to have diverse supply chains to be able to have access, a fair access to some of these important minerals. And why critical minerals are important? The other reason is they have very unique catalytic properties and also luminescent properties and magnetic properties. For example, neodymium, praseodymium, and niobium. And that's where permanent magnets for wind turbines. And as I said, my generation of metals are those ones which are in the inner circle. So which we are very familiar with like zinc, copper, nickel, iron, titanium, and aluminum and gold and platinum and you know, so on. And as you see in the outer circles, so many of these metals that we are talking of germanium, which is very important for renewable energy transition, for example, solar panels, indium, same for solar panels and selenium, you know, likewise, all of these metals are increasingly in demand because the green energy transition and they come as companions to these main, main metals. And that's why their extraction will only become feasible provided there's enough price to pay or you know, the low cost that you are able to extract. And as of now, what we have been doing is we have been conveniently discarding them into tailing stamps and waste streams. And thereby, in fact, uh, in fact, causing harm to our environment because you know, finally they end up, they are very reactive chemical products or chemical elements. And they, some of them are like cadmium, chromium, you know, they've got uh, high lethal uh, impacts on uh, groundwater systems and so on. So by extracting them, now the topic of today is how do we valorize, how do we extract these metals from waste? If we don't, we are causing harm. By extracting, we are supporting the green energy transition and at the same time cleaning up our environments. So just looking at the India snapshot view of India's uh, position as far as critical minerals. It is a little dated, but still, you know, I'm sure the proportionate figures are still valid as far as India is concerned. India is only able to, uh, you know, be producing just one element uh, uh, in, a, in a quantity that is uh, at a kind of, you know, comparable to world production targets. So, there's a lot needs to be done and, and, and India has a very ambitious plan of transitioning to green energy. Our renewable energy targets are 35 gigawatt hour of uh, energy addition per annum, which means about three gigawatt hour, which is equivalent to Victorian grid capacity per month. So that's a huge, huge um, target. And one of the very important underpinnings is availability of some of these important critical raw materials. So there are several countries approaching this issue in different ways. For example, uh, this is about uh, exploring for the future program of Australian government, which was started in 2016 with about $100 million commitment to this. 
but by uh, June 2020, they committed again another $125 million. So in fact, a couple of our colleagues from uh, RMIT University, Associate Professor Gavin Mudd, and also another colleague from University of Queensland, Associate Professor Anita Prabhakar Fox. So they are heavily involved in sort of assessing uh, some of the potential of you know, critical minerals in different waste streams, of mainly the mine tailings. So this is another, this is a kind of program that is happening in Australia. And there's also a kind of consortium that's happening you know, like where the United States, Canada and uh, Australia have sort of formed a working group and they're working towards uh, supporting critical minerals discovery in three different geographical regions. So there are some of those international collaborations. And in fact, there is a quad uh, critical minerals funding scheme that was announced. Uh, quad includes Australia, India, uh, the United States and Japan. So a lot of associ you know, countries are working together to uh, break the conundrum uh, that, that's sitting around. And similar to these programs, the European Commission or European Union also has a uh, Horizon 2020 program, which is also trying to estimate the potential of critical minerals in their tailings and waste streams. So that's a bit of snapshot view of how things are happening. And I will come back and then um, I'll talk about uh, any specific questions in the later part of the discussion. Thanks, uh, thanks, Brajesh, and uh, passing it back to you. Thank you. Thank you, Mohan, for the very comprehensive overview of uh, the situation on critical minerals across the world. And so now uh, I'll request Dr. Chadda to discuss uh, like very briefly, like Dr. Chadda and his group has done a very good study on critical minerals for India, like assessing their criticality and protecting, projecting their needs for green technology. So over to you, Dr. Chadda, we're really looking forward to listening to you. Thank you very much. Uh, let me share, share my screen. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, uh, wherever people have joined us. And thank you very much for inviting me, Professor Dubey, to this event. What we are doing at the Center for Social and Economic Progress, formerly Brookings India, is a comprehensive study on mining and minerals of non-fuels. And one of the most important things that occurred to us while we were beginning this work is how do we handle the critical minerals of which Dr. Mohan Yali Shetty has already given uh, uh, the, the reference to in the global global context. I hope you are seeing the screen in full. In no, you uh, can put it on slides, so please. Uh, yeah, now it's fine. No, not yet. Not yet. But we can see your screen, so that's okay. okay. I think. Yeah, uh, now it's good. Yeah, good. yeah. Good. So I think this work that I am reporting is done with my colleague uh, Ganesh Sivamani. And you can see the paper on our website on critical minerals for India, potential from waste recovery is the title. However, in the first five minutes, I'll be presenting what we have done our work on. First of all, uh, what are critical minerals? And critical minerals are the minerals uh, which have high importance to the economy. And high importance to the economy would refer to how, which kind which kind of sectors they are used? What is the share of those sectors in the gross value added of, of the country? What is the substitutability uh, possibility in the country? And we have uh, went ahead and uh, even worked with, if you see our paper, on the sectoral multipliers, uh, I minus A inverse and, you know, so, uh, First of all, they are important to the economy. Secondly, they are subject to supply risk, whose supply is associated with high risk. And I'll come, come to it uh, in my later slide. So I've given some examples here, indium, silicon and silver for solar panels, neodymium and rare earth elements for wind turbines, cobalt, lithium and graphite for EV batteries, and Copper, chromium, niobium, manganese, and strontium as cross-cutting, cross-cutting in the sense that they are required 
for many of the activities in the in the particularly in the green technologies to which we are moving and uh, the requirement for the critical minerals is important there as i said in solar panels turbines and ev batteries uh, critical minerals have uh, very complex global value chains but uh, these global value chains are highly concentrated high concentration in extracting and processing it can be processing as in china and extracting as cobalt in Congo. China produces 63% of the rare earth elements. More than 70% of the cobalt is mined in Congo with China having the majority ownership. Interestingly, uh, Australia produces more than half the world's lithium. And I think Dr. Eli Shetty will give some more light to it, but much of it is exported to China for processing. China becomes the importer. So, so China is, uh, in a way, uh, taking the lead on concentration of processing and I, I think also the rare earth uh, elements extraction. South Africa mines 72% of the world platinum output. As uh, Dr. Yali Shetty has already shown, India is quite uh, on the back seat as far as critical minerals are concerned both extraction and processing. Why this is important uh, and why the recovery from the waste is important is that if we cannot extract uh, for whatever reasons, you know, there are multiple reasons I'm not going to go into, then we should be able to recycle and process the waste. I'm not talking the tailings, but waste that as we throw our mobiles and uh, computers out of our uh, use. The critical minerals assessment for India, what we have done more, more recently, we have used the EU uh, study that, that has been done, that CSEP study on assessing the level of criticality of 23 select minerals. So this is a working paper and this is work in progress. Suggestions obviously are welcome. Assessment done by quantifying criticality along two dimensions, as I had mentioned in my introductory comments, economic importance, that is mineral consumption, GVA share, which means a, what, how much of that particular critical mineral is used in four different industries and those different industries, what is the GVA share of that, those industries in the economy, substitutability possibility, and downstream multiplier effects. Downstream multiplier effects is a new addition that we have made in, in our paper where we compute the multiplier of those sectors which are using these minerals and then see the important economic importance. The second uh, aspect that we have looked at is the supply risk. Supply risk arises, as I had mentioned earlier, from the mineral concentration. So the concentration can be in terms of extraction. It can be in terms of processing. Recycling rate, which has already been mentioned, substitutability and import reliance of the country, India in our case, whether we are self-sufficient or not. So when you look at this study, you will get all the important elements that I'm discussing. And I will quickly run through because I just get five minutes to speak. Uh, so I have already taken about four. So what we found is that if we look at the economic importance aspect, we have lithium, iron ore, iron, limestone, nickel as so from above the average importance. In the supply risk, India has a serious supply risks on heavy rare earths, indium, neodymium, and light rare earths, and relatively high in both. In both would mean we, but niobium, cobalt, and strontium have serious sub supply risks as well as economic importance. Given that this is work in progress and we are going to be working more and more in the coming months on this, a lot more needs to be done what we have already done. So there are some policy implications. Uh, Dr. Mohan had emphasized this. Enhancing domestic mineral exploration and uh, differentiated allocation process for the deep-seated minerals, developing resilient supply chains, 
comparative advantage of processing, manufacturing, and assembly. All this needs to be seen uh, in, a, in a rigorous analytical framework. Trade agreements are important. And finally, I think G2G agreement uh, or G2G connection with through Kabil, which is the newly introduced um, uh, government entity, which will be looking at how to get the mining uh, rights in the rest of the world. And finally, developing and uh, setting up recycling facilities and waste recovery processes. Later, if I get time, my five minutes are over. Later, if I get time, I'll speak on something on e-waste and the legislation. I think I should morally stop here. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Dove, for giving Thank me. you. Thank you, Dr. Chatta. Yes, we'll definitely come back to you uh, after the first round. And uh, we'll get into the specific waste stream and still starting with e-waste uh, as well. So now I request uh, Tim uh, Warner to kind of give us a uh, Australian perspective of what how things are working in Australia in terms of resource recovery from waste uh, for these critical minerals. Yeah, thank you so much for the um, invitation, um, and uh, I'm really pleased to to be here. Uh, I, I'm I'm just going to give um, a few thoughts basically on on what's been happening in Australia. Um, essentially just to highlight that uh, Australia is, is a big mining nation and we have definitely spent a lot of time thinking about what potential value our mine wastes have. Um, and uh, essentially I, I have three key points to make. Uh, the first being that uh, in terms of critical metals, the potential that mine wastes have, at least in the Australian context, is significantly greater than uh, the potential for recycling. Um, some of the lessons that we have from Australia seem to suggest that that is also the case in places like India too, um, despite a uh, much larger population. Um, when you're thinking about developing strategies to capture the value of critical metals in mine waste, it's worth keeping in mind that you are competing with criticality strategies from other countries. They may be partner countries, they may be considered adversaries. Um, and, and that's just something that's really important to, to keep in mind when developing your own strategies. Um, and the third point is around transparency and reporting, which I'll get into. Um, so a few years ago, I did a material flow analysis of indium in Australia. And I essentially wanted to know how much is in the ground, how much do we mine, how much is wasted through mining processes, how much do we import through finished products like LCD screens and, and solar panels and TVs, how much are we using in order to meet the, the, the demands of a modern Australian lifestyle? and how much have we thrown out over the years? And there's a very clear picture that emerges where you've got something like 14,000 tonnes of indium has accumulated in uh, tailings and slags over time. Um, and these slags is probably uh, separated between only a handful, maybe two or three locations in Australia. So they're highly concentrated uh, in terms of Ocean. Current global demand for indium is only around about 800 tonnes per year. So we've got many years worth of global demand of indium sitting above the ground in a few small locations. Now there's obvious technical economic challenges to separating that indium, but the message is if you wanted to recycle all of Australia's uh, solar panels, TVs, smartphones, laptops, um, you would still only get a very small amount. And of course, everybody would be unhappy because you've taken all of their stuff um, and it's distributed across the whole country. Um, so it seems like uh, any marginal improvements to the ability to capture some value from your mine waste or your processing waste could yield significantly more value. But of course, if we take a step back, why is this in waste in the first place? 
it's because zinc concentrates that contain indium are being sent to facilities that don't have the capacity to process it or separate it out. And that is a key challenge. So uh, it, it's much more preferable if we avoid critical metals going to waste in the first place by ensuring that our smelters and refineries have the capacity to separate them or that we're sending um, mine products to the right facilities. Um, there's a problem with incentives because mining companies don't necessarily see, uh, aren't necessarily paid for byproducts that a smelter or a refinery then separates. Um, in terms of targeting which critical metals to look at, um, it's important to identify gaps in recyclability and down downstream process efficiencies. So it might be that a critical metal is actually quite easily recycled. Um, so that's the case for rhenium. It's, it's extremely uh, expensive metal and it's used mostly in alloys. Um, and so it's actually quite recyclable and uh, recycling rates are quite high. Um, so perhaps there are some things downstream um, that can yield quite a lot of critical metals, um, in which case any efforts to try and get it from mine waste might not be seen as valuable. Um, but for other critical metals where it's quite difficult to recycle, um, quite difficult to collect, which is the case for indium, um, then mine waste becomes perhaps more of an uh, attractive option. And in fact, there is one slag dump um, in Tasmania uh, that has about 20 tonnes of indium, which is uh, roughly equivalent to um, all of uh, Australia's indium in use. Um, so my second point was around um, strategy. So I'm not here to talk about the Indian strategy because I'm not super familiar with it, but it's good to know what your partners are doing. So um, Australia, this is an excerpt from Australia's Critical Mineral Strategy 2022. And Australia's strategy is that they want to be a global supplier of critical. They're not particularly concerned about local demand because we don't have much manufacturing and we have a small population. So Australia's strategy is quite different to the US and EU and China, which is all about protecting our, our industry and, and um, defending ourselves from the actions of, of other countries. Um, so in the context of India exploring its own mines and mine waste to be a producer of critical metals, you may actually to some extent be competing with Australia's ambitions. Uh, to become a supplier. Um, but of course, India is also a consumer too. Um, so uh, in, that, uh, in that context, it becomes really important, um, as, as mentioned previously, to develop partnerships with, with other countries, bilateral agreements, multilateral agreements. Um, and it's useful to think, what would that look like in the case of exploring mine wastes? In Australia's critical mineral policy, what they kind of say is their point of difference from the rest of the world is they say, look how our environmental and social regulations are. Um, we can guarantee a sustainable um, supply of metals that consumers uh, are proud to buy. Um, so I, I guess it's interesting to then think what is India's role in that? What is the story that we're telling about our products and, and where, they, where they come from and how sustainable they are? And my final point is on, if, if you wanna start treating wastes as resources, they need to be publicly reported as resources. And there are um, report mechanisms that, that are used for uh, mineral deposits. There are codes um, like JORC or NI43101, and we can apply these same codes about how much indium or gallium or whatever is in a particular mine waste. 
and when when you use these codes investors have a lot of confidence that that's actually how much there is there and it's economically viable um, in this uh, report here which i was a, a co-author on we talk about what it would take to start reporting mine wastes um, appropriately um, to to basically tell investors how, how much um, uh, critical minerals uh, exist in, in mine waste. Um, so those those were my those were my three points. Um, yeah, thanks so much, and I look forward to the discussion. Uh, thanks, Tim, uh, for uh, giving the, the overview of the scenario in in Australia, in Australia especially from the Indian uh, perspective. So now I'll request uh, Dr. Sapna Narula to kind of talk about that how we can make this business case uh, in, in an environmental sustainable way from an Indian scenario, uh, what, what needs to happen. So over to you, Professor. Uh, thank you, uh, Rajesh. Uh, and uh, other panelists, glad to be here uh, and discussing this very important and significant topic. So um, I think the first point that I want to make uh, in this panel is that why it is the best business case to recover critical minerals from uh, the resources, uh, from the waste uh, that we generate. Uh, number one is that um, Professor Chadda has already highlighted that green energy transitions require uh, you know, critical minerals uh, and uh, thinking of India's ambitions towards a Paris Agreement uh, beyond a two degree scenario, uh, we all know that that we are going to uh, up our renewable energy capacities. We are also uh, going to be using electric vehicles. This is part of our net zero plan. So uh, it is very important to see that, you know, why uh, recovery of critical minerals is uh, better and a comparatively, you know, better than uh, digging it through the ore. So, um, uh, demand for all these uh, minerals is going to be higher um, you know as demand for electric vehicles is going to be more um, these critical uh, minerals are going to be in demand more um, we have seen the case of china the entire critical mineral scenario is driven by the you know the more demand of electric vehicles across the uh, across China. Um, and uh, recovering it through waste will be, you know, lesser and cheaper option. In spite of all that um, electronic waste that we have generated, we have to treat it as our gold. It is not trash because metals you can see have unlimited recycling potential. So, uh, you know, the recovery rate is very high. Uh, plus, uh, um, you know, when you recover metals from these, uh, you know, waste material or landfills, which we call as urban mines, um, you know, when we do urban mining, uh, it generates more as compared to, uh, you know, a, a conventional ore. For example, smart boards. A smart board is, um, you know, it, it's full of these resources, critical mineral resources. And if we talk about one ton of smart board, uh, smart board, it will give us more critical minerals, uh, much higher percentage than we go, you know, uh, get through conventional ore. So, um, you, you know, this is uh, why I say that, you know, this is a better option. Resource recovery is better option than going through you know conventional mining process then carbon emissions that we uh, you know have from uh, virgin material like virgin copper or virgin steel is much higher uh, than the recycling uh, material so that way also you know it is moving towards you know uh, it's contributing to reduction of uh, emissions um, uh, when we talk about the businesses you know um, the cost is an important factor uh, the entire world is now you know as it is moving towards electric vehicle we are talking about the cost of the battery uh, tesla for example the us giant is talking about you know why tesla car is so costly because because of the cost of the battery and 50 percent of it uh, you know battery cost is coming from um, from uh, these three minerals uh, which is cobalt nickel and uh, lithium so uh, if we are able to control the costs 
of this you know we are also able to uh, reduce the cost of the ultimate product which is battery and also uh, the um, uh, also the um, uh, electric vehicle so uh, cost is uh, you know another important aspect and moreover you know when uh, when corporates start generating their own uh, metals from the waste they start recovering it it they actually are taking supplies in their own hand my previous uh, you know uh, friends uh, you know those who have previously spoken they have already highlighted uh, that uh, um you know supplies are limited only a few countries hold the key and you know it is it is a geopolitical issue and uh, it is going to impact the businesses as well the entire product uh, you know life cycle will be impacted so that is how you know if a corporate can initiate recovering critical minerals from the waste uh then um, you know it would be better for them to control the supplies to take the supplies into their hand um uh, every country can be self reliant and especially india which is because of the large uh, renewable energy capacities that we are going to generate it is very important so uh, this is one thing this is uh, so now we know that it is the uh, best case uh, our you know simple mobile phone that is in our hands it also has you know 50 uh, uh, metals and you know how we are going to supply but coming specific you know coming back to india's case specifically why it seems a big challenge uh although you know there are opportunities but uh, we need lot of interventions before we can fully recover this uh, uh yeah, potential uh for example um what i see is that our waste supply chains are highly unorganized and our recycling potential is very low as compared to eu uh, which recycles almost you know 42.5% of its waste asia you know is 11.7% america is 9.4% and africa you know uh, uh, recycling potential is less than 5% india can only recycle you know 5 to 6% of its waste so although there is potential but what are the challenges our waste supply chain is mainly unorganized and um, if, when we talk about it we don't have you know those big trucks and we, we talk about you know small rack pickers uh, and who come and you know they because when we talk about sustainability issues we not only discuss the environmental uh, issues we also discuss the social issues so you know how you know they have to touch the waste and most of these are child labor so we have to see that you know how we make this uh, uh, chain uh, organized and uh, uh, you know this uh, kind of value addition if we uh, start doing i think not only uh, economically uh, but also environmentally and socially also uh, you know we we can make progress so circularity in the waste supply chain is very important right from the disposal to collection to storage or pre processing or you know consolidation and then reconditioning the metal and then recycling so uh, this is very important i think uh, in this entire case uh, various stakeholders have to play an important role number one is the corporates uh, that i've already said that you know it is a best business case and my friend tim has already spoken uh that uh, investors are only investing uh in the companies uh, who uh, who are able to uh, you know bring circular economy or bring circularity to to their chains so maybe uh, i think the one point that you know critical minerals uh, to be highlighted in the sustainability reporting uh, requirements as per the gri framework uh then um the second is the policy options uh, we have to have favorable policies third is consumer education i think that is very important so how is this e waste going to be collected uh, going to be dumped going to be stored uh, and what is the incentive for the consumer to drop the mobile phone in the um, uh, you know um, uh, in the bin so um, if corporates take action they have they also have to see you know how consumer education and stewardship uh, play an important role uh, we also need innovative business models where a consumer or public you know 
Uh, when they do something, uh, uh, they need to be incentivized. Uh, third is, you know, we ha we have to have technological capabilities. So maybe we have to learn from what is being done in Australia or uh, our in-house, um, you know, uh, what, what our IITs are uh, suggesting. So we need to upgrade our technological capabilities in uh, recovery of critical uh, minerals. Brazil has done uh, some good work. Uh, so I think there are a couple of projects that are being done in, uh, implemented in Brazil. I think we can um, turn towards that country when we talk about it. Uh, and then finance. All this requires money, investment needs to be uh, put. So I think this is also an option for, uh, uh, you know, green finance, uh, where small or big projects can be funded. Uh, unorganized sector sometimes, you know, becomes a burden, but it is also an opportunity for a country like India. Uh, because uh, if there is money, if there is value addition, uh, then obviously, you know, more small and medium enterprise uh, enterprises will flow into this particular area, given the focus uh, that our government is having on, uh, you know, SME development uh, and uh, environment um, uh, competitiveness of our uh, small and medium enterprises. So I, I think, um, I, um, uh, as of now, I have... Uh, I have uh, these points only. Maybe later when a question comes sure. up, I, I will uh, talk more on this. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Narula. And we have several questions already in the Q&A as uh, is out there. So we'll get to that. And I'll try to combine the questions uh, so that uh, we can get the thoughts together. So we are talking about e-waste, but in addition to e-waste, we also have, say, mine tailings, we have fly ash, we have red mud, and Lot, lot of slag is also there, which is again, that's also a big, uh, and that is not informal sector. So that's more of a formalized sector. So I'll request Professor Ch Chanda first to kind of talk about what kind of policies uh, you think we need to put in place so that we can try to recover these uh, critical minerals from e waste as well as from these sectors as well. And then I'll ask Mohan to add to that. So uh, Dr. Chanda, please go ahead. Okay. I'll be I'll be brief. I think I left at the policy implications. I'll quickly summarize that uh, you know waste electric and electronic equipment is what we are talking about, and the generation worldwide is 53.6 million tons in 2019, of which only 17% gets recycled. This is from the Global E-Waste Monitor. China and US are the two top contributors to the total electronic waste. India is world's third biggest contributor with 3.2 million tons. And hence, there is a lot of opportunity for India to <clears throat> work on what others are suggesting. And I think great synergies with Australian work that I can see. I've been telling this to Professor Moni Alishati and what Dr. Nurullah spoke about is also in line with what I'm going to show in my next three slide or four slides. India needs to move fast to a circular economy vis-a-vis e-waste and effective legislation. I think there is, a, I am answering some of the questions in the yeah. chat box. Effective legislation yes. and policy making must play a catalytic role. This is the first slide I thought I have on the policy. Why is recycling e-waste important for the green transition coming to the meeting of the Paris uh, COP26 uh, commitments, many of the critical minerals are green fuels for the future. So if we are not able to ex explore and extract, then we should use from uh, what we, pure, we, we, we generate from the waste. Primary mining and extraction impact the environment. So cost benefit uh, is an important study that needs to be done. Recovery from e-waste reduces harmful destruction of those, those uh, e-waste that is lying and can, uh, can contaminate water and other environmental conditions. Benefit-cost ratio needs to be taken into account and how clean or dirty the primary mining activity versus recovery from e-waste is Professor Narula's point that we need to look at more carefully through uh, analytical uh, tools. 
I'm now coming to the e-waste as an urban mine that was just spoken. Global recycling rate, rates are here. I don't want to read it out. So 2040, recycled copper, lithium, et cetera, will be the 10% of less supply requirements from the minerals. Recycled metals are two to 10 times more energy efficient than metals smelted. So I think uh, we get pure material if we recycle, but I'm since you have asked me for the uh, what is what are the rules in India, e-waste under hazardous waste management rules, Basel Convention 1989, 173 countries participated. This con there is a control over the transboundary movement of hazardous wastes. India implemented in 2003 management and handling and amended further in 2008, 11, 16, every processor would have to register with the Central Pollution Control Board. Uh, this is a requirement. Uh, there was a question just now on this, I saw on the, on the question uh, uh, box. Extended producer responsibility, this is Ministry of Environment, Forest and Climate Change, says that extended producer responsibility, EPR, which was introduced in 2011, Producer Responsibility Organization, PRO in 2016, helps collect and recycle the e-waste. Ministry of uh, MOEFCC is a complicated uh, acronym, but this is India's Ministry of Environment, Forest and Climate Change. New EPR rules 2017-18, e-waste collection has to be done by the industry. They must collect 10% of the e-waste in 2017-18, and that is increasing to 20% in 18-19, and to be increased to 40% during 2021. So I'm not an expert on this, but uh, I just laid out some of the policy issues. Collection rate set at 70% uh, in 2022-23. 23-24, uh, I think, I'm, um, this is my typo. And finally, manage the e-waste responsibility. Ministry of Electronics and Information Technology initiated an e-waste awareness program under the Digital India 2015. E-waste program, manage e-waste responsibly. Create awareness about the hazards of unorganized e-waste recycling, which uh, Dr. Narula just mentioned, which is leading to ill health of many of the uh, unorganized labor, children in particular, who are busy 12 hours a day, chipping out things uh, from the mobile phones and laptops, landfills with heaps of e-waste men endanger the environment, organized recovery adds to critical minerals as well as jobs. And some, there are some examples of success. So these are not just stories. Uh, the recycling of Lee, Lee Eon, uh, Leon batteries by Tata Chemicals Gujarat 2021. So I took out some success stories also. So we are failure at many ends, but we have, and then there is a Unico where which dismantles e-waste to extract gold and silver. ECS Environment Private Limited is registered with Gujarat Pollution Control Board. Namo is an e-waste company. Cerebra Integrated Technologies. Sahas Zero Waste manages sustainable disposal, disposal of electronic waste. Producer responsibility augment. So producer responsibility is a very important uh, and, and the collecting the e-waste that uh, from what they have sold is an important, as I said, I am venturing into this as I was requested by Professor Dube. Uh, I, I, by, apart from my paper, I'm not, not an expert in this, but I thought that I should lay out uh, from literature some examples. I think I'll end here. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Chatta. So, Mohan, uh, if you can talk about the other waste streams, uh, we did hear quite a bit on this panel, but the other waste streams also talking, if you can set some light on which are the minerals which are recovered the most from these waste streams right now and why it is happening, where, who is, uh, what is enabling it and where it is happening in the world. So, please, Mohan. Yeah, thanks, Brajesh. I think uh, uh, the way that the whole webinar and the question answer is going is really educative. And uh, if there are students, especially you know the young and up and coming students watching this, so there are a lot of takeaways for them. So like as the research ideas, as entrepreneuring ideas, you know, and also um, how if if there are some nature lovers 
how to take care of uh, nature while it's making money out of uh, recycling of some of these uh, urban mines. So again, being a mining engineer and you know almost with uh, three decades of experience uh, looking at worldview of things, um, I have been always arguing for this point. Like you know, much of the environmental and economic costs of mining the raw material, digging from the depth of the ground has already happened. Like, you know, we, we have used the explosive, we have used, spent the money to buy the fuel and the, you know, crushing and grinding and all of that. So generally the way mining process occurs is you extract, uh, you break the rock into small pieces and then you bring it up and then you crush and grind. The next important high energy intensive process is crushing and grinding which we call as comminution. So you need to bring the rock into very fine talcum powder consistency to be able to separate the metal from its gang materials, right? Which are uh, unvaluable materials in the, in the ore matrix, for example. So you extracted gold and then maybe, you know, some of the gold you discarded along with the other companion metals, for example. So there are cases where uh, people are recovering. And if you look at, there's one case uh, like Olympic Dam, uh, if, uh, because that's iron oxide, copper, gold kind of deposit, which also hosts a number of rare earth elements in, in, in the mix. But currently that's not within BHP's uh, business model because BHP, you know, they, they deal with major commodities and also perhaps that is not in line with what their stakeholders want. Maybe their buyers in China or you know, elsewhere in the world. So it is not fitting to their business model. And that's where a lot of critical mineral companies could be you know, um, kind of startups or juniors or mid-tier companies who, who are willing to get into this and then making things happen. And likewise, you know, there are many examples where companies like Cobalt Blue. So uh, where they are going back to some of the projects in Broken Hill, and they are trying to extract Cobalt out of that. And uh, uh, there, there are cases, uh, for example, there's another mine, uh, Century Zinc Mine, which used to operate in Queensland. Uh, now it is turning out to be third or fourth largest zinc deposit because just reprocessing the tailings itself. In the past, if you looked at the processing efficiencies were not as uh, high enough as it is today, because you know our processing efficiency has increased, right? The recovery rates have gone up tremendously high. In the past, because of low processing efficiencies, you know, and also I, I worked in Goa where mining used to occur, iron ore mining used to happen. Uh, those days, the because of fewer buyers for iron ore mine of Goa, uh, anything less than 60% would be treated as inferior quality of ore. And come Chinese boom, you know, majority of those anywhere between 50 to 60 also got sort of shipped to China because, you know, they could afford that um, high energy, uh, low efficiency kind of blast furnaces. So it, it is all, again, boils down to that process efficiencies. So because in the past, we were unable to recover, so it ended up, and then reprocessing would make sense. As I said, century zinc mine is another example. And there is a similar example uh, in Western Tasmania where uh, uh, a kind of you know, gold uh, deposit, uh, Hallier gold mine, uh, they, are, they are trying to estimate about $1.5 billion worth of gold is contained in the tailings. And now they're going and remining, trying to remine some of that. So there are a number of those case studies. And even if you look at the Chinese example, uh, as Tim uh, was saying that, you know, Australia conveniently sort of dug up the material and then shipped overseas. So perhaps the same material, so from the same ore concentrate, they were recovering other metals, whereas they, become, uh, they became uneconomical uh, yeah. to be to be uh, happening in, in Australia onshore, so that's where uh, the 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 whole narrative is uh, sort of taking place, and uh, 
there's a bit of a growing awareness as to how to uh, take advantage of some of these companions while it's uh, targeting the main metal so if, uh, of, of interest. So if I can add, like say, we saw a hot gold mine a few years ago. And so there are a lot of uh, these kind of tailings are there and the process waste is there. So how to, rather than China doing it and sipping it to China, how we can do it in India itself? Like what, what it will take to make it happen in India? Uh, make it yes. part of the people who want to say that. So. I think uh, currently I'm writing, uh, co-authoring a paper with uh, Professor Robin Batterham, who is considered a guru in in situ leaching. Uh, in fact, it is a conference paper. Uh, nearly the draft is ready. So one of the things that I am proposing there, because I've been thinking this for a while, you know, because if you have to say, even for the for, for, even for the sake of the volumes that you're talking of, you know, millions of tons of waste that would have piled up, whether it is a ash pond or tailing stamp that we saw at Hatti Gold Mines or, you know, Hindalco's uh, red mud, for example. So going back and checking all that through, again, the mills and then trying to recover would be inexpensive. Like, you know, it's very, very highly expensive process. You know, it is cost prohibitive. So what I was proposing is whether in situ leaching, which is very, very successfully used in recovery of, uh, for example, close to 50% of world's uranium comes out of in situ leaching. That means you don't mine, just you pump some fluids and then recover the metal right. of interest. So, uh, there is, uh, according to Professor Batterham, there is a merit in what I'm arguing, and perhaps that could uh, provide uh, tremendous opportunities where you go. Because already, you know, otherwise, if you're leaving them uh, in perpetuity, so it's going to cause more harm to uh, the surrounding environment, especially in India, a country like India, where groundwater is very, very important for, you know, even consumption, uh, human consumptions it's going to be a huge problem going forward. So one, we do good to our environment and at the same time, we derive value out of uh, some of the remnant metals um, that are very important. And uh, one such example that I was quoting when we met in Delhi was, uh, for example, arsenic. You know, gallium arsenide is used as a, a component in making solar panels. So today, uh, arsenic people are paying to get arsenic and in the past we were we, we were spending money to get rid of arsenic in our groundwater systems yeah. or you know surface water systems so how things have turned around in, in, in a short while uh, where we are chasing some of these metals which we never and same with chromium chromium is was used in uh, as a coating material for solar panels in the yeah. past so exavalent chromium, you know, uh, Brijesh, that it's a very right. biggest problem in Kanpur and those areas where Ganges River gets polluted with uh, some of the tannery waste. So how things have turned around in, in, a, in a span of, say, a decade. Uh, now it is up to us, the scientific community and you know, the entrepreneurial brains to come together and to solve this conundrum. Thank you, thank you. Uh, we are almost kind of running out of time. So, Tim, there is a few questions which I have kind of, uh, joined together for you. Uh, is uh, is there a policy anywhere in the world which creates a market for recovered critical material, or uh, if critical minerals in terms of uh, Paris Convention in uh, the global warming, is there any uh, a study which kind of says that say if we can recover all the critical minerals from the waste sources? how much can we achieve that 1.5 degree uh, GHG emission mitigation? Is there anything out there which has come to your, or if anybody else wants to chime in, but uh, Tim, I thought it, you can have seen something. Yeah, I think that's a fantastic question. How, uh, what would actually be the climate change effects of, yeah. of trying to recover all of this? Um, I don't think there is an answer um, because there's actually be a, a master's thesis. Be a master's thesis yeah. for someone. Yeah. Maybe yeah. PhD or not. So, <laughs> not a PhD. Yeah, please go ahead. Yeah. I, there's I a think... lot of. Uh, oh, sorry. Uh, I was just going to say there's a lot of work that actually goes into figuring out how much critical metals are contained in wastes. Um, so if you were to look at India and ask the question, how much of metal X is there, 
you have to actually know well how many phones are there in India how many TVs how many and you know you can look at import statistics over time and you can look at statistics for manufacturing but then you don't actually know how much people have thrown out over time or whether it's still sitting in their drawer at home um, and so uh, it's a very kind of loose science at time to figure out what is the actual size of the prize. Um, and, and, you know, we, we do some statistics and we can come up with a very rough order of magnitude to know how much there is, but then for it to actually be recovered economically is another question. So can we actually get it? Um, it uh, is, a, is another big challenge. And then if, if we do get it, how costly is it to process or how, how which then raises questions about what, what are the actual carbon benefits. Yeah. Um, for sure, we know we need these metals for renewable energy technologies. Um, and in some cases, we, we might need to get them whatever way we can. Um, but so when we talk to, about to actually... them in terms of in terms of the purity of the recovered minerals, uh, is there, of course, we want it to be as pure as it is, but is there any standard out there that uh, you need to have this much pure to really, uh, is there, I mean, is yeah, that's, so, one, that's one of the questions we have. Yeah. Mm, so the one big problem with the economics of waste recycling is that price of metals can fluctuate so, so quickly. Um, mm -hmm. And they're, they're not stable. So uh, if, if you had a look at Indian over time, they, they, they just fluctuate wildly. And, and one day it seems like recycling is a wonderful idea. And then the next day it's not viable at all. Um, so a lot of e-waste recycling is going to be driven by gold and silver. And then we might see in future if we can get some other critical metals out, if, if technology comes along that allows us to separate them cheaply. Um, so it's hard for us to say you need this much, this sort of grade of, of metal X in order for it to be profitable. Um, and we know this with, with mining, uh, you know, not just urban mining, but regular mining too. Some mine operations can be profitable with very low concentrations um, because they've got the supply chain in place, the technology, um, perhaps a, a large volume of material and others are only profitable with extremely high grades in order to, to scrape a, a tiny profit. And then on the other side of things is that you might have a mine that's extremely rich, but we can't access it or we can't mine it for environmental and social reasons. Um, uh, yeah, so it's, uh, yeah, we are yeah. kind of uh, <laughs> yeah, in the stretch of time. Dr. Darula, there is a question on, and if you can very briefly answer that, uh, because we're already above time now. So there was a question on the International Electronics Manufacturing Initiative. They had a task group on reuse, repair, recyclability for the e-waste electronics. So how is our policy framework uh, kind of matches with that? Do we take that into account in our Indian uh, e-waste framework? Uh, our e-waste framework is really, you know, uh, as Professor Chanda said that, you know, it's very nascent and uh, we are, see waste management is an entire ecosystem so we have to you know uh, develop the entire ecosystem backed by various kinds of favorable policies and uh, technologies invest investment and other things so uh, i think uh, these next five years that we are you know this ecosystem is being developed uh, but there is a lot being done um, and uh, i'm sure but uh, together, uh, you know, if all the stakeholders join hands, uh, we, we can work in this direction. Uh, plus, I just wanted to add on to the previous question that you posed to Dr. Uh, Tim Warner. Uh, in fact, there is a uh, sustainable materials uh, group at MIT, 
who are working on the uh, you know potential of various um, minerals from uh, recovered areas so they are also working on the ghg emissions and they are also comparing the uh, waste supply chains from different countries uh, and the competitiveness of uh, recovery of these minerals at various locations across the world so um, uh, th these studies are being done and uh, uh, being published also uh, so uh, this is uh, something that i wanted to add i, I thank hope you. Thank it benefits uh, the uh, audience yeah thank you thank you so final final thoughts to dr chadda so if you can uh, uh, kind of say that uh, looking at the topic uh, today's topic how to really make it happen in india like uh, what is your uh, based on your vast experience in different field if you can share final yes. thoughts for next couple of minutes and then we'll close it yeah um, am i audible yeah yeah you are yeah, oh, okay uh, i think uh, what i have said earlier uh, where the responsibilities have to be fixed and standard operating procedures have to be built in and we we have already moved forward on this and i i do hope that these policies would work but at the same time uh, i do have a comment on the question uh, that that was asked that earlier that. that is you know somebody has to seriously study one of the statements that i had made that by 2040 recycled copper lithium nickel and cobalt very important four elements from spent batteries could reduce combined primary supply requirements of these minerals by around 10% so it will be interesting to study that if there is a global market for that what are the, and and then the engineers come in uh, rather than economists that is it worthwhile uh, recycling these four battery elements to to the extent that primary supplies would be 10% less and that much less pollution will be created in the in the, in the primary uh, mining but at the same time the cost benefit has to be analyzed in terms of how much more emission we will create by virtue of recycling which is again an engineering subject and i think india needs to uh, one of my one of my you know statement that i have been making is that india needs to learn from countries like australia and canada as far as mining extraction is concerned india needs to learn from many other countries with regards to the policy uh, i hope you know that very little is being spent on exploration there is not many many international companies have joined hands after many have left so a lot more on exploration particularly the deep seated minerals would be important i think i'll stop there yeah so thank you thank you dr chanda for the final thoughts uh, we i'm sorry that we had to kind of uh, uh, but i think we took care of most of the questions in direct and indirect way and uh, again uh, thank you all the panelists for uh, especially to our friends from australia it's already kind of close to midnight there so thank you and we uh, for the uh, participants you can keep yourself updated this will be available as a recording will be available on the west voice web uh, website and of, of course uh, if you have any question you can reach any of us through our linkedin uh, pages so which is uh, you can find us on linkedin easily so thank you again akansha over to you thank you so much dr dube for conducting this really really informative and thank you all the speakers for having for uh, being part of this and i would also thank all the attendees to be part of this uh, the recording will be available on the website soon be based for based uh, wise uh, website and uh, for any other information and upcoming events uh, we have scheduled them uh, for next uh, you know month as well so they all uh, will be intimated through our social media and our newsletter so we request everybody to subscribe to that thank you so much for having us everybody thank you thank, thank you very you. much thank you very much and thank yeah, you yeah. everyone yeah. Yeah. thank you bye so we thank you very much thanks bye bye, -bye.